You know, when you pick up your Bible and you begin reading through it, it is a book that is full of warnings that were given to a variety of different people on a variety of different occasions. You think about those wise men in Matthew chapter 2 who came to see not baby Jesus lying in a manger, but a toddler Jesus who was a little bit older than what we read about in the, in the, in the book of Luke. But those wise men who had journeyed and came to find Jesus and how they were warned not to go back to Herod. They received a warning. Similar to that warning that the young prophet received back in 1 Kings chapter 13 where that young prophet was warned, don't you go back the same way that you came. Do you remember when God was warning Lot and his family in Genesis 18 and 19 about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? You remember that God warned Lot and his family that the cities were going to be destroyed, and what did he warn them not to do? Don't turn around. The Bible is full of warnings for those individuals that were living in those days. But when you pick up your Bible today, it is still full of warnings even for us today. There are warnings for us as we began talking about this last week. There are warnings for us how imperative it is from the mind of God that we abide in His doctrine that we follow and stay true to His doctrine. And yet the Bible is full of warnings for those individuals who would not stay true to the doctrine of Christ. And so this morning I want us as a second part of what we started talking about last week to talk about the danger that God warns us about. The danger of abandoning sound doctrine. And when you hear that expression, and maybe you weren't here last week, when you hear that expression, sound doctrine, you know, that's something that we may not think about, may not hear it often. And so we, we may have differing ideas on what that involves. And so let me just share with you very quickly just a few reminders of some of the things that we talked about last week. We talked about the fact last week that when it comes to sound doctrine, that simply what that means is that it is a teaching that has been given to us by God that is true, that is accurate, that is correct, that is free from errors. When we pick up our Bible, we have in our hands the teaching of God. It is truly a fixed body of doctrine that has been revealed to us by God. And when we pick this up and we read the sound doctrine that we have from God, this word also tells us that if there is a sound doctrine, then there must also be those doctrines that are not sound. If there, are those doc if, if, there, if there is that doctrine that God calls sound, that is true and accurate and correct and free from errors, then there must also then of necessity be some doctrines that are not. Otherwise, he would not talk about his doctrine being that which is accurate and true and sound. And so our responsibility is to make sure that we get into the text of God and we find that one true sound doctrine of God. We pointed out last week that every time you find the word doctrines or teachings in, in the plural form of that word, every time you find that in the New Testament, it is always used of God in a negative sense. It is always condemned by God. God looks at the doctrines of men and God does not approve of them. And yet we turn to the New Testament and we read about the doctrine. You remember the 18 different descriptions that we put on the screen last week of how 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus describe the doctrine. There's only one. It is the gospel of God. There's only one of those. It is the faith that has been once for all delivered. There's only one of those. And so it is our responsibility to get into God's Word, to learn that truth, to follow that truth, because it is only His doctrine, it is only His truth that can lead us to everlasting life. I recognize this morning, just as last week, I recognize that there are those here today who are visiting with us. 
And recognize you may be here and maybe you're trying to investigate churches. Maybe you're looking for a church to call your church home. Maybe you've been around and you've been here or you've been there and you come here and now, now for the second week in a row there's a sermon about doctrine. A sermon about sound doctrine. And maybe, as we talked about last week, maybe to you that's, that's, that comes off negative. Why is a church spending so much time talking about doctrine? Well, because Jesus turned to his disciples who were turning away from him in John chapter 6. And he said to his apostles, are you going to turn away from me also? And Peter said to him in John chapter 6 and verse 68, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And it is those words that we are seeking to follow in this place. It's those words that we're seeking to find inside the Word of God. And this morning, as, as we look at these warnings that God has given inside of His Word, as we look at the danger that God has given inside of the, of the Word of God in regards to those who would abandon sound doctrine, please, please don't let the messenger get in the way of the message. Please don't let the preacher get in the way of what does God's Word say. And I would encourage you this morning to, to open up your copy of God's Word. And I would encourage you this morning to, to investigate the things that are said in light of what God's Word says and say, what should my response be to these things? Because the Bible throughout, but especially in the New Testament, gives us a number of warnings when it comes to false doctrine. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Turn your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4, to that text that was read this morning. Because here is Paul writing as we have his last letter. His last letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote is the, is the book of 2 Timothy. And as he gets to the last chapter of the last letter that he is going to write, he bids Timothy, pleads with Timothy in verse 2, Timothy, you've got to preach the word. Notice the singularity of that again. You've got to preach the word. There's one message, Timothy, you've got to preach. And then he tells him, here's one reason you need to do that in verse 3. One reason, Timothy, you've got to preach the word is because the beginning of verse, four, the beginning of verse 3 begins with the word for. He says, you've got to preach the word because the time is going to come when men will not endure sound doctrine. Here's the sound doctrine of God that God bids Timothy. You've got to preach sound doctrine, Timothy, because the time's going to come when individuals are not going to endure sound doctrine. They will no longer want, they will no longer accept, they will no longer follow sound doctrine. But instead, they're going to, they're, they're going to want something different, and because they want something different, and because they have itching ears, they're going to heap up for themselves. They're going to create their own teachers they're going to follow these teachers that they have created and to follow after them and departing from sound doctrine. And departing from, he says, departing from the end of verse 4, turning away from the truth and being turned aside to fables. Paul warns Timothy that the time's going to come when individuals are not going to endure sound doctrine. Was Paul te teaching Timothy something new that had never been said before that time? No, if we go back in our Bibles, you go back to Matthew chapter 7. And guess who was warning about false teachers in Matthew chapter 7? Jesus was. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 15, Jesus used the word beware. He said, beware of false prophets, beware of false teachers. You know what Jesus said that these false teachers were going to be doing? He said, they are wolves that are going about in what? Sheep's clothing. They were wolves who identified as sheep. Does that make sense? For a wolf to identify as a sheep? We live in a day and age where you can identify as nearly anything that you want to identify as today. But here's a wolf identifying as a sheep. But what is he? Is he a sheep? No. He's still a wolf. It doesn't matter what they claim to be. They're still, Jesus is warning, still about these individuals who would go out and teach those things that are contrary to the will of God. 
You keep reading in the book of Matthew, and it's Jesus again in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus warns about the specific teachings of specific religious groups. He says, beware of the leaven, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees and Sadducees were the largest Jewish groups of that day. In other words, they were the largest religious following in that area. I want you to think about that. Is that a nice thing to do? Here's the largest Jewish groups of that day. They have the largest followings. Surely they're okay, and Jesus says they're not okay. He says, beware of their doctrine. Is it possible? Is it possible that even large groups today may not have the right doctrine that they're teaching? Jesus warns about that. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 12. But you keep reading your Bible, and again we come back to Paul warning about the fact that false teachers would come into the church from the outside. And in the very next verse in Acts chapter 20, he said there would also be false teachers who would come from the inside of the church. That some, some who had never been a part of the church and even some who were a part of the church would rise up among themselves to draw away disciples after them. It wasn't only Paul. Peter warned in 2 Peter chapter 2. Warned about teachers who would come in, and he uses the word secretly. False teachers don't come in with a big banner around their, head, around their neck and saying, I'm teaching false doctrine. Peter says they're going to come in among you secretly. John in 1 John and in 2 John warns about false teachers, and he uses the word many. He says many false teachers are already among you. And guess what he calls these false teachers? He calls these many false teachers, these many false prophets, he calls them antichrists. John does not indicate for us that there was only going to be one singular antichrist. The teachings of John, John is the only one who teaches us about antichrist. And John is the one who tells us, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and even go down through verse 6, 2 John chapter, uh, well, chapter 1 and verse 7, he talks about there being many teachers, many antichrists. And he wasn't saying they were going to come in the future. He uses the word in 1 John chapter 4, they're already here. John's warning about them. The Bible warns about the fact that there would be individuals who, who would who would be more readily following every wind of doctrine rather than just following what the Bible teaches. And he says, and, and the, the New Testament warns us, that there would even be those in 1 Timothy chapter 1 who would engage in lawless activities, lawless behavior. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10, God describes even lawless behavior as being that which is contrary to sound doctrine. Not just words, not just teachings, but even activities, lawless deeds that are done. I want you to look at the screen. Why is it that God is warning us about all of these false teachers and all of these false teachings if doctrine doesn't matter? What does this tell us? In the eyes of God, does doctrine matter? In the eyes of God, does sound doctrine matter? In the eyes of God, there is one path unto heaven. And God warns us that there are many other individuals who are going to teach many other things that are contrary to sound doctrine. And he says, don't follow down that, those paths. There are some people today who hear the idea of doctrine. They say, no, 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 I'm not, no, no, I don't want that. Just, I'll, I'll, I'll take Jesus and you can have your doctrine. Friends, you can't separate those two things. You cannot separate Jesus from doctrine. And let me, let me, see, let me, see, if we can, let me see if we can further illustrate that fact. Not only do we read these warnings in the New Testament over and over about these doctrines that are contrary to the will of God, but then God tells us, okay, what are the consequences I mean, sometimes, have you ever warned your kids about, don't you do that, and then there weren't any consequences for if they did it? Maybe not you, not, not you, but have you ever seen other parents 
other parents out in public who said, don't you do that. If you do that again, and then they, they state something, you know, some big concept, and then the kid does it again, and what happens? Hmm. Have you ever seen parents who said, I'm going to do this, and then they didn't do it? There, there really weren't any consequences for the kid's behavior. We're just talking theoretically here, right? Not, not, not personally, just theoretically. If God gave all of these warnings about false teachers and false teachings, is he one of those that he just warns about it, but yeah, it's no big deal. There's not really any consequences if you go down those paths. Is that the case? Not at all. He not only warns us about these teachings, but he tells us what the consequences would be if we turn from the truth. If you look in Titus chapter 1 and you begin in verse, in verse 9 where he, he bids us to follow after sound doctrine, you get down to verse 14, he tells us when you turn away from sound doctrine, you're turning away from the truth. And those individuals who turn away from the truth, here's what the New Testament says. They deceive many. Jesus said that false teachers don't just deceive a few. They deceive many. It's the same thing that Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter said many will follow after these teachers. No, so it's not just a small number who are affected by it. Jesus used the word many. Peter used the word many. In fact, Paul said that they, these false teachers would subvert whole households, that entire families would follow after these teachings that are contrary to the will of God. Those are some severe consequences, are they not? To seeing that following after God's will has consequences, has rewards, and yet if I don't follow after the will of God, what may happen to me? What may happen to the church? You keep reading through your New Testament and you find that there are consequences where the Lord's church is going to be ravaged in Acts chapter 16 or Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, it talks about how disciples would be drawn away. They would no longer be following the Lord. So here's the Lord's church being impacted negatively from the outside and from the inside, where disciples are drawn away, meaning they're no longer following the Lord. They're drawn away to follow after others. And so these false teachings and false teachers, Romans chapter 16, cause divisions in the church. You look around the religious world today. Any divisions? Any divisions around the religious world? It's full of them. Not just full of them. The religious world today is characterized by division. Where did it come from? Read the New Testament. It came from those individuals who were teaching doctrines that were not according to the doctrine of Christ. And when those divisions come about, what happens to the truth? Well, the truth remains the truth. The truth never changes. But it's interesting, in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, Peter says, when these individuals give way to following after false doctrines and false teaching, you know what they do to the truth? They blaspheme the truth. They're following after man-made doctrines, and so when they hear the truth, they make fun of it. They speak light of it. They speak evil of it. They blaspheme the truth of God because they have adopted and started following after man-made doctrines. So if the truth of God is being blasphemed while individuals are teaching other doctrines, what about these other doctrines? It's interesting in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 17 that Paul says about these man-made doctrines, they will spread like cancer. Or your Bible might say, they will spread like gangrene. What's happening with these doctrines? The doctrine of God is being blasphemed, but the false doctrines are permeating the world and are spreading around the world. In fact, if you go to the verse right before it in verse 16, it says, it is leading individuals to even more ungodliness. Let me ask you something. When God gives us warnings about these doctrines that are contrary to the sound doctrine of Christ, do we recognize the consequences that come about from following after those doctrines? 
God, God does not say that these are, these are minimal consequences. He does, not say, he, he does not say, well, it's no big deal if you follow after these. He says these false teachings, these false messages, they're going to be spread around the world. It's going to lead to more ungodliness. Jesus talked about the fact that individuals, their own worship was in vain. Well, let me share with you two thoughts about these individuals who are teaching doctrines that are not according to the will of God. Look in 2 John, or look in the little book of 2 John. Just go, go to the book of Revelation and turn back a couple books to find the little book of 2 John. There's individuals, when they hear all of this emphasis on doctrine, they say, no, no that, that, that's, that, that, that's too much for you. I, I'll take Jesus and you take doctrine. In 2 John, the little book that only has 13 verses in it. 2 John, verse 9. 2 John verse 9, the Apostle John writes and says, whoever, that's, that's a word that includes everybody, whoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ. Your Bible might not say transgresses. Your Bible might say whoever goes too far and does not stay within what? The doctrine of Christ. How many doctrines does Christ have? One. And what is that doctrine? It is the doctrine that comes from Christ. To say, well, I'll take Jesus and you can have doctrine. You can't separate Jesus from his doctrine. They are one and the same thing. But I want you to see what verse 9 says. Whoever does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Is that a pretty severe consequence of not following after the, 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 the simple and singular doctrine that we read about in the New Testament, the sound doctrine of the gospel of Christ? If I don't abide in that doctrine, but I go and I go too far, I, I, I add to what this says, I, I, or I come short of what this says, God says, I don't have God. But you keep reading, it says, but he who abides in the doctrine of Christ, he who stays within sound doctrine, he has both the Father and the Son. God tells us that if I am one who is teaching something that is not true to the will of God, or if I am one who is following some doctrine that's not true to the will of God, I am not saved. Cannot be saved in the eyes of God. To be teaching or following a doctrine that's not real. And somebody says, wow, that's really hard. That's really narrow. Or somebody might even say, that's pretty narrow-minded for you to say, please don't let the messenger get in the way of the message today. Read 2 Peter chapter 2. Read the book of Jude, where over and over in those passages, the text is saying that these false teachers make great swelling promises in their words, but they can't fulfill them because what they're teaching is not true. May I appeal to you today, especially if you are visiting with us today. Please don't take this as some kind of a, of a high and mighty, arrogant kind of message that looks down upon others. It's not that at all. In fact, as I've worked on this lesson this week, I have tried to make sure that I was just as humble as I could be when I opened this book. And as humble as I could be when I tried to investigate what does the Bible teach us? And to hold up God's Word and allow God's Word to show us the warnings. To allow God's Word to show us the consequences if we don't follow after His sound doctrine. It's not, it's not just some minimal kind of thing. It's not, well, you know, it's not really, you can believe what you believe and I'll believe what I believe. And, well, hang on a minute. God says it makes an eternal difference. Amen. We don't have time to, to look at this particular point and so I'm not going to dwell here. But there are many examples in the New Testament of those who had turned from the truth and how they started teaching other doctrines. There's examples in the New Testament of people who taught doctrines about salvation that were not true. They were teaching people what they needed to do in order to be saved that God had not taught them to do in order to be saved. Is that okay to do? No, that's not okay to do. 
there were individuals in the New Testament that were teaching things about worship that were not right in the eyes of God. There were individuals in the New Testament that were teaching things about the church, saying, oh, that church, it's a sect in Acts chapter 24. Teaching things about the church that were not true. Teaching things about marriage, divorce, and remarriage that were not according to the doctrine of Christ. Teaching things about the second coming of Jesus Christ that were not according to sound doctrine. And I only put these examples up there to show us that if these things were being taught then, if untruths were being taught even in the days of the New Testament, could untruths about these doctrines and others still be taught today? And if they were not acceptable in New Testament times, can they be acceptable today? Our responsibility is to get back into this book. As we close, let me share with you some instructions given to us by God in His Word when it comes to sound doctrine. God instructs us in His Word to beware of false teachings and false teachers. Each one of those verses and others we could put on the screen has that word, beware. You ever gone to somebody's house and they had a sign that said, Beware of dog? I respect those signs. I respect those signs. When we went to, when, went to New Zealand in 1994 on a, door, on, a, on a campaign there, we were there for three weeks and we knocked on doors in New Zealand. And I, I think it was, a, it was a requirement of citizenship in New Zealand to own a big dog. Because every time we went to somebody's house, there was a big dog. I learned great respect for beware of dog signs. God gives us warnings in Scripture. Beware. But not just beware of them. 2, Timothy, or 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 17 says, Beware that you don't follow down that same path. Watch out. Not only watch out for the teaching, but watch out that you don't follow down that same path. So everything that I hear, 1 John chapter 4 teaches us, Everything that I hear, I've got to put it to the test. 1 John chapter 4, and verse 1, God says, Don't believe every spirit. Don't believe every teacher. But test the teachers whether they are of God. Don't believe every person who stands up and holds a Bible and says this is what the Bible says, including this person who is standing up and holding a Bible and saying this is what the Bible says. Every teacher must be put to the test. Even the Apostle Paul was put to the test in Acts chapter 17. If the Apostle Paul came here today, would you just accept anything the Apostle Paul would say to you? The Bereans in Acts chapter 17 didn't just accept it. The Bible says they searched the Scriptures with all readiness to see if those things were so. What did they search? They didn't go and search their traditions to see if what Paul was saying was true. They did not go search the doctrines that were being taught down at the local synagogue to see if those things were true. They went and searched the only standard that matters, the Word of God. Hold every teacher you listen to to this standard. That's the instruction that God gives to us. God tells us that we need, when we find those teachings that are not right, we need to withdraw ourselves. These verses on the screen use the word withdrawal or they use the word avoid. Don't become buddy-buddy with them. Here are teachings that are not according to the will of God. And the Bible says, I need to step away from them. I need to back, I, I don't need to, in fact, when you keep reading on in that passage in 2 John, when we stop short only in verse 9, verses 10 and 11 say, don't show any approval of those things. The Bible says, he who would bid God speed, he who would show approval to those who, who don't teach the doctrine of Christ, he said, we become partakers in their evil deeds. We cannot afford to show acceptance. We cannot afford to show approval to those teachings that are not according to the will of God. Amen. Instructions that were given in God's Word is that we are to use Scripture when we can to correct those teachings that are not right. We read that in Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. God instructs us to remain steadfast on our own to make sure that we don't follow after those teachings, that we remain steadfast and true to the will of God. And God instructs us in His Word. We saw it in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. We've got to preach the Word. We've got to stay true to the Word of God and not teach any other doctrine.
Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, charge those individuals not to preach any other doctrine. Somebody says, is this really all that important? Your eternal destiny depends on it. Somebody says, that's overstating it, I think. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Jesus says, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who says unto Jesus, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, then who will enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus? But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Where do I find the will of my Father in heaven? I get into his doctrine, his teaching that he has left, and I learn his teaching. If you keep reading in what Jesus says, he tells the, the parable of the wise and the foolish builders. What's the difference between the wise and the foolish builders? The wise builder hears the words, the teaching, the doctrine of Jesus, and does them. But in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22, Jesus says, Many will say unto me on the day of judgment, Many will say unto me on that day, Lord, Lord, we're confused. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In your name? Haven't we cast out demons in your name? Haven't we done many wonders in your name? Lord, we're, we're, we, we've done all of this for you. We thought we were following you. We thought we were teaching your doctrine." Jesus says that he will say to those individuals on the day of judgment, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never approved of you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Our eternal destiny depends on making sure that we do the will of God as it's revealed in his word. May God help each and every one of us to do that. May God help each and every one of us to be honest in our reading of God's Word. And make sure that we take it and we apply it as, as simply as God expects us to apply it. Can I share with you some thoughts about the sound doctrine that God reveals to us about salvation? There's a lot of teachings out there today about salvation. There, 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 is, there is a particular there's a particular uh, tenet of teaching today that's been around for about 500 years. You take it all the way back to the 16th century. And this particular teaching and, and, and the various tenets of this teaching permeate denominationalism today. And yet, can I share with you what the Bible teaches about salvation? The Bible teaches about salvation that everybody needs to be saved at least everybody who has committed sin needs to be saved. The Bible does not teach the little baby is born in sin. The Bible teaches that sin is an act that I commit, 1 John 3 and verse 4, and when I commit that act, I then need that sin that I have committed, not inherited. I need that sin forgiven by God. I need to be saved from the sins that I commit. But the good news is, is that salvation from sin is available to everybody. God's salvation is not available only to His, His few that He has chosen. God's salvation is available to all men because Jesus died for all men. Jesus did not just die for a select few. Jesus tasted death for everyone, Hebrews 2 and verse 9. And with salvation available to all, because Jesus died for all, that salvation from sin is only possible, we know, because God gives it to us as a gift. It's available to us only by the grace of God. We can't earn it. We can only receive it by God giving it to us as a gift. But that does not mean that it does not require obedience on our part. A gift can still be a gift given to us by the grace of God, but still require obedience. Still require that conditions be met. Your children go to college, do they get a scholarship? 
when they went to college. It was a free gift. It's free money. We got free money to go to school. Did that free gift come with conditions that grades had to be met? Oh, that's not fair. It's free money. What do you mean it's not fair? It's a gift, but it still had conditions. God's giving us something better than that. He's giving us salvation from sin, but it requires obedience on our part. Salvation from sin requires that I believe that Jesus is God's Son. That he came and died on the cross for my sins, not His own. He was buried in that tomb and He was raised the third day. Do you believe that with all of your heart? Salvation from sin requires that I repent of those sins that put Jesus on the cross. Not, not sins that I have inherited, but sins that I committed against my Lord. I need to change my mind and say, I don't want to sin anymore. I want to stop doing what's wrong and I want to start doing what's right. The New Testament teaches that it's with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. I'm not there yet, but salvation requires that I make that confession unto salvation. And it is only when I'm baptized do I receive salvation from sin. Somebody says, I don't believe that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Peter said in Acts 2 and verse 38, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Ananias said to Saul, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Paul reminded the Galatian Christians that they had all been baptized into Christ. They hadn't got into Christ any other way than being baptized into Him. And it was only at that moment when they were baptized that they received that gift of salvation. It was Jesus who said, he who believes and is baptized, that person will be saved. And it's only upon being baptized that someone becomes a part of the Lord's kingdom. That the Lord adds him to his family, to his body, to his kingdom. Jesus said, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He's got to be baptized in order to become a part of the kingdom, a part of the church. And it's only at that moment when one becomes a part of the kingdom becomes a part of the church, that he is enrolled in heaven. Those who are enrolled in heaven in Hebrews 12 and verse 23 are those who are part of his church. Read the verse. Those who have everlasting life in Romans 6 and verse 23 are only those who are in Christ. They only got into Christ because they were baptized into Christ. The New Testament teaches that's the only way to get into Christ. And salvation from sin, according to the doctrine of Christ, requires that I continue living faithfully. The Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. The Bible teaches that once I am a Christian, God bids me, He pleads with me, He commands me to be faithful unto death so that I can receive the crown of life. I suspect if you are visiting with us today that there are some things that have been said today that maybe you don't agree with. Some things today that maybe you have not heard before. Some things perhaps today that you have that have been said that maybe have offended you. And it has not been my goal to offend anyone nor to come across in a harsh, arrogant, or ugly manner. And if I have, please forgive me. But does not the Word of God make it so plain just by looking at what we've seen today that in order to get to heaven, I've got to follow the doctrine, the teaching, the one fixed body of doctrine that is true and accurate and correct and free from errors that God has given to me, given to you. Are you a Christian this morning? Have you done what the New Testament tells us to do in order to be saved from our sins? If you're not, if you haven't given your life to the Lord, why don't you do that today? You can be baptized here this day. Give your life to Him and allow the blood of Jesus to wash away every sin that you've ever committed. We're going to sing a song that says all things are ready. Are you ready? But if you've already done that at some point in your past, if as a child of God you have not been living the faithful life that He calls us to live, and you need the prayers of the church to get back in a right relationship with God, if this church can help you get your life right with Him, why don't you come right now as together we stand and sing.